Uh, let me get the recording started. And uh, if you're not aware of this, you can go to paradoxes.org and uh, you can download uh, recordings of previous classes. So everything is archived there and uh, you can either listen to it or you can watch it in full video. That's at paradoxes.org. And yes, uh, this evening at seven o'clock Pacific time, I'm gonna be interviewed by the apologist, Sean McDowell. Uh, he's the son of Josh McDowell. Uh, he's a real friend of the Reasons to Believe ministry. He's gonna interview me uh, about my book, Weathering Climate Change. And that interview will go from seven to 8 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, it will be, uh, it's gonna be, uh, yeah. And if you go to my Facebook page, or my Twitter page, or if you go to Sean McDowell's Facebook and Twitter pages, you'll see there a link uh, where you can participate live. It will go live tonight at 7 p.m. And yeah, you're welcome to participate and uh, you'll find the link uh, on my Facebook and Twitter pages, as well as Sean McDowell's Facebook and Twitter pages. So with that, let me uh, share a screen. And, okay. And just to let you know what's going on, we're gonna try to wrap up this series we've done on human origins. I may not wrap it up today because several of you have asked some uh, questions that is actually governed in a slightly more technical talk uh, that I gave and I realized that needed to be updated. So I've completely updated that uh, and I actually gave that talk about a year and a half ago. So those of you who've heard it before, I'm gonna go quickly through the material we've already covered uh, and then uh, hit the new material uh, that's just been published in the last uh, few weeks and few months. Uh, and eventually, uh, and we're probably within a few weeks, uh, we're gonna move the Paradoxes class back to a classroom and uh, you know, the church where I've been serving for 45 years, uh, they've asked us to move the class because they want to renovate the room that we've been using. That renovation will take some time. And the Reasons to Believe headquarters is only a few miles away uh, from Christ Church's Sierra Madre, where I've been serving as a pastor. And so we're going to have the class uh, at the Reasons to Believe headquarters in Covina. And we're also going to change the time because a lot of people have said they would prefer if we had a later time uh, than our 1045 start. And so we're thinking of maybe moving it. Uh, well, we'll give you an announcement on the exact time. It'll probably be noon or 1230, which gives people time to get from their churches here in the California area uh, over to our headquarters and be able to participate in person. Uh, the conference room we have is large enough that we're going to be able to have appropriate social distancing. But yeah, when we do this, we're going to ask that all of you uh, come with your uh, face mask and we'll be making available face masks if you don't happen to have one. And uh, we don't have a date yet, but probably sometime in July, we'll be starting to have it in person. However, we're going to continue to live stream. So all of you that have been participating with us uh, through Zoom, we're gonna continue uh, through a live stream feature. It may not be Zoom, but it will be uh, live. You'll be able to watch it in full video. You'll be able to ask questions live, just like you're doing uh, right now. And uh, you'll actually be able to, to see what's going on in the classroom as well on my visuals and me personally. So that's coming up. And uh, once that gets started, uh, the church where I serve is asked if we would do apologetic series that are much shorter than what I typically do. So they've asked us to uh, have a set of series that run from two weeks to eight weeks maximum and uh, on different topics pertaining to science, faith, and the Bible with the idea that this will be video recorded and uh, made available at a number of websites so that uh, we'll be building up an archive of a science, faith, Bible, uh, many courses that uh, we'll be able to make generally available. So that's, that's, what, that's what the future is. And they've actually asked me, told me what they'd like us to do when, once we're ready to launch that, namely to begin with a, a series 
of short uh, cla classes uh, that deal with science and the early chapters of the Bible. And so we'll probably do a series on Genesis 1, then one on Genesis 2, and you get it. We'll go all the way through uh, to Genesis 11. And we'll pick up the science faith topics there. But we're going to partition it into standalone uh, uh, series that'll run from two to eight weeks. And we'll also be bringing in experts. Uh, I'm not going to be the only expert involved in the presenting this. We'll be bringing in people that'll have some material to share uh, with us on that. In the meantime, we're going to finish up this series on human origins. And uh, if we're not ready to launch at the new facility, uh, then uh, we will uh, do some short series on uh, my new book, Weathering Climate Change. And we'll be giving you announcements about details in the next few weeks. So with that, uh, let's see if we can quickly wrap up this uh, one message we've been having on human origins and what the science says, what the Bible says. If you all recall, we spent a few weeks going through every single passage in the Bible relevant to human origins. That's all available for you to watch at uh, paradoxes.org. It's also archived on YouTube. And uh, again, uh, you can read in considerable more detail uh, the reasons to believe human origins model. And uh, you can get a free chapter of our 400 page book at reasons.org slash buzz. And you can get a free chapter of a book that, that I wrote uh, by the way, I co-authored that book with Buzz, but he wrote most of the chapters. Uh, but this is a book I wrote, Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job, where I contrast the exceptionalism of the soulish animals, the birds and mammals, with the exceptionalism of human beings. And we're offering a free chapter at reasons.org slash Ross. And a number of you have told me if you had trouble accessing uh, the video recording of our Human Origins Workshop, <coughs> And uh, I did some checking into this. And yes, it is available, uh, but the search engine at reasons.org does not pick it up. Even when you type in reasons.org uh, slash human origins workshop 2020, uh, it will not find it. We're uh, fixing that feature on our search engine that may be fixed within the next few days. However, if you put that into the URL box at the top of your computer, it will find it. So that's the way to get to the Human Origins Workshop. Uh, you can put an HTTPS uh, slash reasons.org, but all you really need is reasons.org slash Human Origins Workshop 2020. Uh, put that in the URL box at the top of your computer. It will find it. And it'll actually pick up the entire uh, day's recording of that workshop. And that's interesting for those of you who want to see how well the reasons to believe human origins model uh, stands up to critique uh, from atheists, anthropologists, and theistic evolutionary apologists. So feel free to check that out. And where we left off last week, we were looking at the tools that are being produced by the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. Uh, these are what the most advanced tools look like. Basically, they're tools of hard rock obsidian or other kinds of rock uh, that have been shaped uh, by striking one rock against another rock. And uh, you can get some fairly sophisticated and uh, useful stone tools uh, by this means. Uh, so, and another example of the advanced tools that were used by Neanderthals and Denisovans is how they were collecting seashells, large seashells, and uh, breaking them in such a way that they'd have really good uh, scraping instruments. But as I mentioned last week, what we see uh, with the tools associated with the Neanderthals and the Denisovans is that they're single items. You don't see the sophistication of human tools uh, where you've got a piece of wood that's been shaped and joined uh, with a shaped stone tool and uh, using uh, you know, cords and sinews to attach it like you would, for example, an ax, or what you see with a bow and arrow, uh, or the shovel. Uh, what we see here are uh, simple implements uh, consisting of a piece of a shell uh, or a shaped rock uh, that can be used for a variety of, uh, 
of means, things like, and typically use for scraping meat off bones, since Neanderthals and Denisovans primarily survive uh, by hunting large bird and uh, mammal uh, creatures. And then last week, I think we pretty much got through uh, this set of uh, claims you see in the scientific literature uh, that the Neanderthals had technology. As I mentioned last week, there's a debate going on in the scientific literature. One side is saying that Neanderthals <coughs> were really quite sophisticated. Were really quite sophisticated. Basically, these are anthropologists trying to claim that Neanderthals are as fully human as we are today. And they claim that uh, as they look at the artifacts associated with Neanderthals, they see evidence that they were burying their dead, controlling fire. They were uh, manufacturing and playing advanced musical instruments. They were developing advanced tools and that they were using symbols. And the last week we talked about how the burial evidence is really no more spectacular than we see with elephants. Uh, elephants will bury their dead uh, in a way where it's actually uh, more substantial than the evidence we see for Neanderthals. Case of Neanderthals, there are actually some claims that they were engaged in a funeral service because they see evidence of flower pollen uh, within 10, 20, 30 feet of a Neanderthal, uh, part of a Neanderthal skeleton. And uh, I'm arguing that could be coincidental. And the throwing of flowers is really no more an expression of a spiritual item than uh, elephants, for example, wandering around, circling around uh, the dead matriarch elephant and heaping straw on her body until her body is covered. And yeah, the control of fire, we made the point that they were, the evidence we see is no greater than the fact that they were opportunistically taking advantage of wildfires in the same way that chimpanzees do too. We really have no evidence that they were manufacturing hearths and using those hearths to bake bread, whereas we got considerable evidence that was a case for early humans, that indeed uh, they were um, actually planting grains, harvesting the grains, and uh, uh, grinding those grains and roasting those grains, grinding those grains, and using hearths to turn them into bakery products. We don't see that uh, for the Neanderthals. And we talked about the Neanderthal flute. It's just a piece of a femur bone with a couple of holes in it. And there's a big debate whether that uh, could be a flute or not. And there's now a consensus that that's not a musical instrument, but rather the holes were punctured uh, by a predator. And then advanced tools. We do see a little, I mean, what you do see with uh, the bipedal primates is with each successive species, there seems to be somewhat of a direction that the tools become more advanced but the entire base of tools we see, uh, they're all single items, a piece of shaped stone, uh, a piece of wood. Uh, you don't see them being joined together to make something as sophisticated, say, as a bow and arrow. And uh, there's also a dispute about the fact that in the region of Europe, southern region of Europe, uh, where you see caves that were occupied by Neanderthals occupied by humans, also occupied by bears. And uh, where, as I mentioned in previous weeks, the dating tools we have are not sufficient to establish uh, whether or not the Neanderthals and humans were overlapping, whether the Neanderthals were there first or the humans were there first, but it does open up the possibility that Neanderthals uh, may have been stealing tools uh, that indeed were manufactured by humans. But again, we see no evidence of things like a bow and arrow associated with Neanderthals. We do see uh, advance in the uh, stone in the sense that we see that uh, more work went into shaping the stone than stones that were used earlier. Uh, but Neanderthals were here from 250,000 to 50,000 years ago, maybe as late as 45,000 years ago. And it's really uh, disputed whether we see any advance in tool technology whatsoever 
over that time period. Radically different from what you see with humans. With humans, you see rapid advance in technology. With each generation that goes by, you see the tool use becomes uh, more sophisticated and more advanced. Number five, we barely hit on before we ran out of time last week, which was the use of symbols. And where papers are published where they try to claim that Neanderthals uh, were using symbols is where they see rock faces with linear scratches on. That's the extent of a claim for symbolic expression uh, by Neanderthals and Denisovans, is where you see a piece of stone uh, or a part of a cave wall that's got scratches on it. But the scratches are linear, and uh, you don't see anything like uh, an alphabet like you would get uh, with uh, humans or cuneiform symbols. It's just simply uh, short linear scratches, uh, which could have been there simply for no symbolic purpose whatsoever. Uh, they may have been trying to see how well their tool, uh, how sharp it was by just scraping it against the wall. Again, this is techniques that we see um, chimpanzees using today. So the bottom line is we really have no evidence uh, for symbolic expression uh, for the Neanderthals. Uh, no evidence that they had a numbering system uh, or an alphabetic system. The strongest evidence for this symbolic expression was something that Fazal Rana and I discuss. It's posted at paradoxes.org, uh, the session we spent describing the Neanderthal string. That's actually the strongest evidence. And basically they're trying to claim that if the Neanderthal was doing a three strand weave, uh, then that means that they had the capability of figuring out the distinction between one, two, and three. And the researchers, when they published their paper, says this shows that they were skilled in arithmetic. Well, that's a stretch. And I made the point, for example, we see birds doing this kind of a weave. And yet, as we observe these birds, it's clear uh, they have no awareness of an arithmetic system or a system of numbers or to how you use those numbers. And again, if you get that recording, uh, you'll see that there's considerable dispute whether that weave was made by Neanderthals at all. I mean, we're talking just a millimeter of length where we see three strands coming together. I made the point that it could be there strictly by entropy. If you've got uh, you know, threading material, it's just happening to lie around one another, they tend to wind up. I think we've all seen that uh, with our garden hoses, uh, that that just happens when you throw things in a heap. Uh, or it could have been birds that did it, or it could have been humans. Because we now know, thanks to a paper I discussed about a discovery of human activity in Bulgaria, that humans were there at that time and they could have been responsible. We're only talking a millimeter. Anyway, I won't go into any more details on that because uh, you can get the, uh, the recording. And uh, Fuzz Rana also uh, did a Facebook Live on that discovery. Uh, so look at that and look at the uh, paradoxes.org. Uh, class recording uh, for more details. This is where I want to wrap up uh, this particular uh, keynote. I got a second keynote, but we'll wrap up with this one. Uh, namely, that when we look at Neanderthals, uh, they're always depicted in museums as wearing clothes. But the truth is, we have no scientific evidence that they ever wore clothes, and a lot of scientific evidence that they were not wearing clothes. And as I mentioned uh, last week, one piece of that evidence is the relatively narrow geographical range in which they were living. They were living in an area where their uh, bodily morphology, the fact that they had short limbs, uh, they had a lung capacity of nine liters, the males did, uh, barrel shaped, uh, their nasal capacity being as large as it is, uh, they were well adapted for a cold climate, but we notice that uh, their region of habitation uh, never got into, say, North Germany or North England. Yes, they did get into Southern England. They got into France. Uh, they got into Southern Germany. Uh, but they stayed away from the places that got really cold. And likewise, they stayed away from the places that got warm. So they kind of stayed in the region that would fit well the fact that they were naked and were not wearing clothes. 
It's quite possible they had a lot more hair than we did. There's a debate going on just how much hair they had. Uh, most anthropologists believe that they had a lot more fur or hair covering their bodies than we do. That would explain how they're able to survive there. And their low populations. I mentioned last week uh, that the population level, the maximum population level of the Neanderthals only reached thousands. And we're talking thousands over a range that extends from Siberia all the way into Spain and England. So they lived over this huge region, uh, but there was only thousands of them living at one time. And they had actually developed clothing technology, their population would have risen considerably above thousands. But the fact that it was only thousands, again, is a piece of evidence uh, that they uh, were limited uh, by their lack of clothing. And basically were just spending all of their time simply trying to survive, trying to get enough food so that not too many of them uh, would starve to death. I won't go into number seven here because I think we've covered that in sufficient detail that we really don't see any evidence uh, for technological advance. We also find that all of their skeletal remains we have found have been in caves. So evidently they were taking advantage of caves so they could deal uh, with the climate. Again, that's a piece of evidence that they were not wearing clothes. Uh, they had clothing technology and they wouldn't have had to constrain themselves to living in caves uh, to deal with the changes uh, in the weather and the seasons. And uh, that's also evidence that they were not constructing dwellings. With humans, we see immediately they're constructing dwellings and the dwellings actually provide them with protection from the elements. So with humans, immediately you've got clothing technology, immediately you see them uh, constructing dwellings. This explains why they were able to do so much better uh, in the context of a changing uh, weather and the changing seasons, whereas evidently the Neanderthals uh, did not have any of that. And so, and again, that would explain their low population. If they needed to be cave dwellers in order to survive, there's only a certain number of caves around uh, that you could use. And moreover, uh, often those caves are favored by bears. So they would have to fight the bears uh, to take uh, possession of a particular cave they wanted. Number nine, I think is particularly significant. We see no evidence that they had domesticated any animals. Whereas with humans, again, the domestication of animals shows up as soon as we have the capability of detecting uh, that data. And so this is again, something that the Bible tells us is unique to human beings. Uh, we humans, alone have the capacity to tame animals. And some people disputed that in the scientific literature saying, well, we do see evidences of, uh, for example, uh, cats uh, serving and pleasing dogs. But it only happens when both the cat and the dog are tamed by a human being and are, are bonded to that same human being. I mean, we've seen that with the animals in our household, uh, how we've had times and when we were raising our children where we had both a dog and a cat. And yeah, we would see uh, the cat grooming the dog, uh, taking care of the dog, uh, but it's only because both the dog and the cat had a strong emotional bond with the human members of our family. Independent of human beings, we see zero evidence that any of the non-human animals tame other animals and no evidence uh, that uh, the Neanderthals or the Denisovans had the capability of taming animals. Whereas with humans, we see abundant evidence. And the whole point there is what we see in both Job and in Genesis is that God endowed uh, us human beings with a capacity to tame and domesticate of the soulish animals to serve and please us and to emotionally relate to us. And, this, and likewise, he gave these animals uh, the desire to be tamed by us and to serve and please us. And it's a one-way direction. They have this desire to serve and please a higher species of life. And likewise, we human beings have been endowed by our creator with the capacity to relate to a higher being and to serve and please that higher being. That was really my motivation for writing the book, Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job, to make the point 
that if we study the solish animals, uh, the birds and mammals, and a handful of the reptilian species that have the capacity uh, to bond with us human beings emotionally and to serve and please us, we can learn a lot of spiritual lessons that are relevant to ourselves. For example, how it is that our sin causes these animals to run away from us instead of their God-designed uh, desire to come towards us. It's our sin that causes them to be afraid of us and to run away from us. Likewise, it's our sin that causes us to be afraid of God and run away from God or to pretend that he does not exist. As we see that these animals uh, have in, within them uh, this innate desire to serve and please a higher being, likewise we human beings have innate desire to serve and please a higher being. As the full potential of these animals is only realized when they're bonded to human beings, likewise the full potential of us human beings is only fully realized when we're bonded uh, to God. Uh, all of us who've been Christians for a while have actually experienced that, uh, how our intellectual capabilities, our spiritual capabilities are considerably enhanced once we develop that relationship with God. Number 10 here in the list, we see no evidence for symbolic uh, capability. Uh, I cite a number of papers uh, establishing this uh, in my book, Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job. Uh, for example, no matter how much you were to train, even the smartest of the non-human animals that cohabit the planet with us today, uh, whether it be a chimpanzee, uh, whether it be uh, a dolphin, uh, and the smartest of the non-human animals are uh, crows and ravens, you still can't get them to figure out what a stop sign means and to react appropriately or a railroad crossing sign. So very simple symbols uh, that are easy for all of us humans to recognize and appropriately respond to. The non-human animals can't do that. We see no evidence that that was the case for the Neanderthals or the Denisovans. Um, no evidence that they had developed an alphabet or they had developed a number system uh, or arithmetic or knew how to use symbols. I mean, for example, again, we can take the non-human animals and give them the symbols and uh, they can play with them you know, like little cutouts of the alphabet, but they, they really can't put them together to make words or put numbers together uh, to come up with a, a correct equation for the manipulation of those numbers. This is unique to us human beings. And we, this is also a capability that would be crucial for developing a spiritual relationship with God. Uh, so with that, uh, that concludes uh, this series that we've been doing on human origins. Again, you can find more details, Hidden Treasures in the Book of Job. Get your free chapter at reasons.org slash Ross. By the way, that's available to anyone uh, who goes online. And again, this book now in its second edition uh, by Fuzz and myself, uh, reasons.org slash Fuzz. Here's the Human Origins Workshop. And with that, let me exit. And what I'm going to do is uh, stop this presentation and let's see, I've got about uh, six minutes in which I can get started on this next one. And I'm gonna just quickly go through stuff we've already covered, but try to get to the new material uh, that we've not had a chance uh, to look at. So let me get this started. And I think we're still in the share mode, so I should be able, uh, Let me see if this works. Okay, all of you should be seeing the first slide, which is the first slide I have every talk, which simply indicates, hey, if you don't get all your questions asked, you can ask questions of all of our scholars on their individual Facebook and Twitter pages. And hey, if you're not already subscribing to the RTB YouTube channel, uh, you can do that and uh, it's free and uh, you'll get notices of all the new videos that uh, we're producing. And just quickly to remind all of you uh, that Genesis 1 doesn't teach just one origin of life, but three distinct origins of life. You see the word create used three times in Genesis 1. 
first time when it's talking about God creating the physics and the chemistry. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's matter, energy, space, and time. And I believe that would be consistent when we see in the Genesis 1-3, where it says, let there be light. And I believe this is when we see the origin of life is purely physical in nature. Uh, but then it's followed up with what we see in creation day five, where God uses the word create, Hebrew word for create bara, for the second time only, where he creates the soulish animals, the land animals, the sea animals, and the birds of the sky. And last of all, he creates the one and only species that's physical, soulish, and spiritual. And again, uh, we have that in this, these two books. Let me go through that quickly and the workshop. And here we go to the origin of human beings. This is the standard story uh, that you see in all the textbooks on anthropology, uh, whether you're in a high school or at a college. Uh, this is the picture they give you. How the claim is that we human beings are not the product of special creation by the God that created the universe, Rather, we're the, pro we're the result of natural common descent uh, from a knuckle-walking uh, creature. And uh, then, of course, uh, maybe we're even descended from a more primitive knuckle-walking creature. And feel free to just put whatever sports bias you have uh, into that. And... Okay, here's the naturalist story. The naturalist story is that you've got this single bacterium that evolved from a primordial soup on the ancient earth. Uh, we're gonna do a series on the origin of life probably sometime next year. And we've written a book on the origins of life, but this is kind of the, the model there. And so we start with what they call LUCA, the last universal common ancestor, which is a single bacterium that evolved naturalistically out of a primordial soup, that's the claim, and how that single bacterium evolved into human beings via natural processes over 3.8 billion years. Just want to remind you that uh, evolutionary biologists do get offended when you refer to this as Darwinian evolution, because uh, Darwin was really only looking at natural selection, and evolutionary biologists say, look, we're not talking of just one natural process like Darwin was, but several. Uh, but the three that are most significant would be the natural selection that Charles Darwin proposed. Uh, then it would be mutations of the DNA. And then the third would be gene exchange, uh, where one species actually uh, shares genes with another species, a lateral gene exchange. These are the three uh, predominant mechanisms. But here's the problem is a number of research scientists, both evolutionary biologists and interestingly physicists, have looked into just how probable is this? So looking at the natural processes and seeing all the different changes you've got to explain, how you get from a bacterium uh, to a bacteria uh, that reproduce not just asexually, but sexually. And then you go from a prokaryote uh, to a eukaryotic life form where you've got a nucleus inside the cell that contains all the chromosomes, then uh, how do you go uh, from a single-celled organism to a multi-celled organism where the cells all have differentiated functions? These are some of the challenges uh, that evolutionary biologists face in trying to explain how by strictly natural process we get from a single bacterium to human beings and uh, these are two research papers that have been published. Francisco Ayala uh, is an evolutionary biologist uh, at uh, University of California at, here in Irvine. And in one paper he published, and I cite these uh, papers uh, in um, uh, my book, More Than a Theory, he calculated the probability of this happening through natural process alone is less than one chance in 10 to the one millionth power. And then three physicists, John Barrow, uh, Brandon Carter, and uh, Frank Tipler said, well, wait a minute, uh, Francisco overlooked some crucial features here. 
and basically making the point that this is all going to happen in the context of the changing physics of the sun, uh, the earth, and the moon. And when you take that into account and other things into account, the probability is less than one chance in 10 to the 24 uh, millionth power. And to put that in some kind of visualizable uh, context, uh, that one chance in 10 to the 24 millionth power is roughly equivalent to someone here in California uh, winning a $200 million uh, lottery jackpot uh, three million consecutive times where that individual buys just one ticket each time. And of course, it would become incredibly wealthy in the process. Uh, but as one mathematician friend of mine put it, that probability is really no different than an individual uh, winning that kind of a big jackpot three million consecutive times uh, where he or she doesn't buy any tickets at all. The probability uh, is essentially zero. And again, to put this in some kind of context, that's 24 million zeros after the one. If you were to count the total number of protons and neutrons in the universe, that only adds up to 10 to the 79 protons and neutrons. So just based on uh, these probabilities by two independent uh, uh, groups of uh, scientists, the idea that we can explain the entire history from a bacterium to a human being by naturalistic processes alone is incredibly remote, let alone the problem with trying to explain how you get the bacterium in the first place uh, just from naturalistic physical and chemical processes. However, my friend Kenneth Samples, a philosopher here at Reasons to Believe says, here is another really big challenge to a naturalistic explanation uh, for human origins. How do you go from a non-conscious bacterium uh, to an individual uh, that is as conscious as we human beings? How does one, one uh, get conscious? How does one get conscious spiritual beings from non-conscious matter? Because that's really the evolutionary paradigm. You begin with atoms and molecules, you get a bacterium, and then that bacterium evolves into human being. Uh, but those atoms and molecules have no consciousness whatsoever. And so how do you go from something that has zero consciousness to something that's conscious? As my friend Kenneth Sample would make the point, you cannot get the lesser, uh, or pardon me, the greater from the lesser. It violates the principle of cause and effect. It violates the principle that we live in a universe with an extremely high entropy measure. Given the high entropy measure of the universe, it's simply not possible to get something that's so much greater, namely consciousness, from something that's so much lesser, having no consciousness at all. Effects cannot be greater than their causes. The created cannot be greater than the creator. Thus, the living, the personal, the mindful, the conscious, and spiritual cannot come from that which is non-living, impersonal, unconscious, mindless, and non-spiritual. And again, I'm uh, citing my friend, Kenneth Samples. He says, it's not only the problem of where you get consciousness from, uh, from a naturalistic perspective, where do you get the mind? Where do you get the spirit? Where do you get the personality? Uh, where do you get the uh, capability of living and reproducing and being able to manipulate your environment and exploit your environment in the context of the very high entropy measure of the universe? And so these are all uh, challenges, but when you put them all together, in the words of Ken Samples, uh, you get an overwhelming case against any naturalistic model uh, for the origin of life, let alone uh, the origin of human beings. And his whole point is to explain how we humans have a mind, have consciousness, are aware, uh, we have a theory of mind, uh, we're personal, able to engage in, uh, personal and emotional relationships, and uh, we can engage in spiritual activities. That implies that we must have gotten all those characteristics from someone who is personal, conscious, has a mind, is a spirit, is indeed living, uh, has a theory of mind. Okay, I'm going to stop here because I've used up my time, but this is where we're going to go next week is looking at uh, the difference. And we're not going to just look at Neanderthals and uh, the Denisovans, but actually get into 
the genetic distinctions. When we're going to have some of this new material, there's been a major set of uh, advances in papers about the genetic diversity uh, and whether or not we can actually discern whether we human beings are the product of special creation or naturalistic evolution by looking at the genes of humans, Neanderthals, and humans, and whether or not it really is true uh, that in common uh, with the Neanderthals and in common with the chimpanzees, we've inherited by naturalistic evolution not only junk DNA, but deleterious DNA. Major debate. I'm just going to hit the highlights of this. If you really want to go into this in detail, my colleague, our biochemist, Fazal Rana, he's the expert on this, and he's written literally dozens of articles at reasons.org on this whole question about do we really have a shared inherited genes uh, that are deleterious in common with Neanderthals and chimpanzees, or are we overlooking a function because we didn't know where to look for this function. You can kind of get an idea where he lands, uh, but he's very thoroughly reviewed the scientific literature on that. I'm simply uh, going to give you the highlights on that. So with that, I'm going to stop the share feature here. And we'll take questions for the remainder of the time on any subject that people uh, care to raise. Thank you, Hugh. We have some excellent questions already coming in. Remind everyone that if you have a question, you post it on the Q&A section. That if it doesn't get answered this time, come in at about 15 minutes early next week or any week and post the question again, letting us know that you have a question that didn't get answered the previous week. We'll put you at the head of the queue and Hugh will answer the questions then before the regular lecture starts. So with that, we have a question from Stephen Posta from Spring, Texas. You stated both in your writings and during your talks that man's contribution to additional greenhouse gases have offset and therefore delayed the onset of the next ice age. At this point, 2020, approximately how many years of delay do you think mankind has delayed the next ice age? Well, that's a good question. We've already delayed it by about 5,000 years, maybe even more because what we know about the changing tilt of Earth's rotation axis and the changing shape of our orbit is uh, that it typically brings us very quickly into an ice age. And you see that in the previous ice age cycles, that you hit a maximum temperature and you quickly drop down into a very low temperature. And that's well explained by the changes in our rotation axis tilt and the shape of Earth's orbit uh, about the sun. And yes, it was thanks to the temperature being spike being interrupted by what's called the uh, Younger Dryas cooling event. And we now know that was caused by a giant asteroid striking in northwestern Greenland. So that stopped the temperature from going to the maximum and actually set about a period of short climate stability. That climate stability was extended uh, by humans launching civilization and through the launch of that civilization, uh, through human activity, began to warm the surface of the Earth by the same amount uh, that these orbital cycles were cooling the planet. And they've been in balance, literally, for the past 9,000 years. It's starting to get out of balance in that if you look at the last 8,700 years, we see that the global mean temperature very gradually cooled by one degree centigrade. But since 1950, the temperature has gone up by one degree centigrade. So right now, Earth's surface is as warm as it was 8,700 years ago. And the concern is if we let it rise another two degrees centigrade or three degrees centigrade, we'll be at that maximum point uh, where we'll melt the polar ice cap and we melt the polar ice cap that's going to cause sunlight to be absorbed far more efficiently by the open liquid water, which is going to result in snow falling all over Canada and Siberia and quickly bringing on an ice age. And we'll be in that ice age for quite a while, tens of thousands of years. The question is, can we extend this period of climate stability? And I'm going to be talking about that tonight when I'm being interviewed by Sean McDowell. I argue that we can and that we can extend that period of climate stability 
that we've been enjoying for the past 9,000 years uh, while we boost the world economy. I think what's made this such a political hot potato is people are saying we're facing a crisis. Uh, we're going to go into extreme climate instability if we don't do something. And if it means sacrificing our economic well-being by factor two or three, so be it. And I'm arguing you know, people who are trying to make those kinds of proposals are not, not taking into account that we human beings are fundamentally selfish. And because we're fundamentally selfish, uh, we're probably not going to go along uh, with these government rulings uh, to sacrifice our economic well-being to that degree. And I also argue there's no way you're going to get all the nations of the world agreeing to do that either. And that's been pretty evident and the political dialogues have been going on, which is why I've been proposing in uh, weathering climate change several dozen ways that we can sustain this climate stability while we enhance the economy, give people an economic incentive to actually work to stabilize the climate. However, I also argue that that can't be done indefinitely. An ice age is coming no matter what we do. We simply can delay it, and I argue we can delay it uh, well, I know we can delay it for probably a hundred years, even if we do nothing. Uh, but if we take the appropriate steps that uh, do stabilize the climate while we enhance the economy, we may be able to extend the climate stability for 14 to 1500 years. Personally, I can't see us extending it beyond that. However, that's more than enough time uh, for the human race to fulfill its purpose and its destiny as described in the pages of the Bible. That would include all possible uh, eschatology models, models of the end times that people have interpreted from different passages. Whether you're a post-millennialist, an amillennialist, or a pre-millennialist, uh, that additional 14 to 1500 years gives us all the time we need and then some to fulfill our purpose and our destiny. Thank you, Hugh. We have a question from Camille Yesitko, and he asks, how is it that despite all the discoveries of science that justify a belief in God, there are so many scientists who don't believe? What is stopping them from believing? Well, I address that question in my book more than a theory, saying uh, it's really a myth uh, that scientists are essentially all atheists and agnostics. Uh, surveys have been done of American men and women of science uh, ever since 1916, and they consistently show that about 45% of all uh, employed research scientists believe in God and an afterlife. They may have different religious beliefs, but that's what they all hold uh, as a consensus. They believe in God and an afterlife. Those surveys also show that you get a much stronger percentage of scientists believing in God and an afterlife in the physical sciences than you do in the life sciences, and many more in the life sciences than you do in the social sciences. And consistently, uh, mathematicians have stood around 80% of them believing in God and an afterlife. At the bottom, you see people like uh, sociologists and cultural anthropologists down around 1%. Uh, believe in God and an afterlife. And, uh, you know, people have made the comment that the more concrete and the hard the science is, the more likely that people are going to see the scientific evidences for God. I've also commented that one reason why you see fewer in the life and social sciences believing in God and an afterlife is that predominantly they're doing their research on what the Bible identifies as day seven the day when God rests from his work of creation. And therefore, these scientists looking at the human ear say, we see no evidence uh, for supernatural intervention. It all fits a naturalistic uh, paradigm, but it's because they're looking on the wrong day. For six days, God creates. On the seventh day, he rests. And God's been resting ever since he created Eve. And so if a scientist is doing research uh, in the human era, uh, that scientist will not see evidence for God's supernatural interventions. Whereas many scientists in the physical sciences, geophysics, astronomy, uh, physics, a lot of their research takes them into deep time. 
uh, where they see the evidence uh, for supernatural interventions. So hopefully that helps. And if you want to see documentation, it's in the book more than a theory. Thank you, Hugh. Mark Durham from the Los Angeles area of California asks, in chapter 20 of your book, Weathering Climate Change, you mentioned Bitcoin elimination in order to save vast amounts of electrical power. Is this related to blockchain information storage? And could you please describe that? It's partly related to that, but not only related to that. Uh, I didn't say, I actually wrote quite a bit about the Bitcoin thing. Our editors trimmed it down because they said, you know, unless you're a coder, you're not going to really appreciate or understand this. But the bottom line is, yes, uh, we're talking about uh, the exchange of these Bitcoins uh, taking place through computers, uh, the storage of uh, this uh, Bitcoin um, currency. And if you add it all up and just see how much electricity is being consumed uh, to maintain not only the banking of these Bitcoins, but the exchanging of these Bitcoins is a combination of the storage uh, of that uh, currency and the exchange of that currency. And keep in mind, they're also taking into account uh, people who uh, trade the Bitcoin currency uh, for hard currency. I mean, just to give you an example, uh, our reasons.org site several years ago got hacked uh, by people overseas. Uh, they were in some Eastern European country and uh, they demanded payment and Bitcoins in order for us to be able to retrieve all the data that we needed. And uh, we figured out how much money it would cost us to retrieve the data where we didn't give them any money and discovered that uh, these people were smart they actually put their price at about three times less than what it would take for us to actually go to all the trouble of physically recovering all that data. And so uh, we paid them and uh, we paid them in Bitcoin, but we had to use real dollars to buy that Bitcoin. And so when we talk about the energy use, it's not just the Bitcoin exchange, it's the exchanging of real dollars or real hard currency uh, for Bitcoin currency add it all up and it's shocking just how much energy is being consumed. And if we could eliminate wholesale uh, all this virtual currency, uh, it would do a lot uh, to save the use of electricity. And by doing so, we wouldn't need to burn so many fossil fuels. And yes, it would be a big help in the stabilizing the climate. And hey, if we can find some way to eliminate this virtual currency, it would also get rid of a lot of crime and getting rid of that crime would help boost our economy in a way we wouldn't need so many fossil fuels. All those things were taken into account. And just to reassure you, uh, we've now taken steps at Reasons to Believe to store all of our critical data, not only in California, not only at our office and offsite, but also out of state. So that uh, if this ever happens to us again, uh, where somebody tries to extort us uh, through a hack, uh, we've got cheap ways of recovering our data. Right now, at the worst, uh, we would lose a few hours of one day to recover that data. So I just want to reassure all of you who are supporting reasons to believe that, yeah, we've taken steps to make sure this doesn't happen to us again. Thank you, Hugh. Uh, Tonette asks, how would you suggest we win <clears throat> for Christ members of the LGBTQ community, Muslims, and others from very different cultures who may have been stigmatized as being immoral or dangerous? That's a good question. And for example, with respect to the LGBTQ, and I don't know, I think there's 57 letters now uh, to describe all these different uh, sexual preferences. Um, mm -hmm. My experience speaking in Canada, I think is relevant. Uh, Canada actually has a law where even from the church pulpit, it's illegal to say anything negative about uh, practicing homosexuals or lesbians, for example, uh, or transgender people. However, you are allowed to address sexual immorality as long as you don't identify a particular group. And I think that really puts it in the appropriate biblical context is that the Bible is basically saying we need to relate to one another, relate to one another in a sexual way where we're actually enhancing the kind of intimacy 
that God wants all of us to enjoy. And uh, so uh, I think that's the way you engage these people. Just say, look, uh, God's goal for you is that you would really experience intimacy at the deepest possible level. And, uh, you know, we human beings are tempted frequently, all of us are tempted to try to get that intimacy without investing the necessary spiritual, emotional, and intellectual effort uh, to make that all possible. And this is where I think we can take people to the Bible and say, this is what the Bible says about how we can develop uh, you know, more intimate relationships. And uh, this is uh, for our benefit. And, uh, you know, we take shortcuts, we experience the consequences. And, uh, you know, God's uh, for intimacy, he's not against intimacy, uh, but he wants to make sure that we don't uh, sell ourselves short on this. And I found when I'm in, in Canada speaking in churches, that goes down really well because you're basically making a point. Every human being on planet Earth struggles uh, with sexual purity. It's something that's common to all of us, but God's given us the tools to pursue that. We'll never be totally pure, not in this life, but we should all be making progress. And so whatever individual I'm talking to is basically, okay, how are you doing in your relationship with Jesus Christ? How are you doing at progress towards developing uh, more intimate relationships with all the humans you know? And often it begins uh, with really identifying, okay, where have I been hurt by humans in the past? How have I been hurt? And I've appropriately acknowledged the pain, processed the suffering, actually allowed the wounds to heal. It's amazing to me just how many people wander around with big, open, personal uh, relationship wounds that have never been dealt with and never been healed, and where there just isn't the forgiveness and where, as it says in scripture, if you will not forgive one another, uh, then how can I forgive you? Because what you're doing is claiming, I've been offended greater than God has been offended. And of course, that is not true. We need to recognize the degree to which Christ suffered in our behalf in order that we can come in to an eventual relationship with God and with one another, where the intimacy will be far beyond anything we can experience. And with respect to Muslims and Buddhists, and Hindus, people have different uh, faiths. I, again, would encourage, we reach out to them by saying, you know, there's something, I mean, there's something good about every religion. Almost every religion has at least some of the elements of uh, the 10 commandments and the greatest commandment to love our God and to love one another. Um, but to actually say, okay, you know, for example, in Islam, uh, God, Allah, is a distant God. And uh, it's every Muslim I've dealt with really has that pain and wondering, how can I really have the intimacy with my creator that I desire? Here, I mean, the more Quran says he's all caring, all loving, uh, all merciful. Uh, but how do you get that? Where is the eternal security? And so basically making a point, uh, you know, there's more than what you're seeing here. And uh, look for that more. I mean, I wrote a piece years ago, it's in my Today's New Reason to Believe. Uh, if you look at science, science only works from the perspective of a triune creator. And if God is triune, uh, where you've got the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit relating to one another, experiencing love with one another before they create anything, then that means this is a God that's in a position to be able to express that kind of love to each one of us and where we can experience that and actually by uh, example, be able to express that to one another. And so uh, again, real intimacy only comes from a Christian worldview perspective. And again, my colleague, Ken Samples has written extensively about this in his blog at reasons.org. There's a follow up to that, I'll be happy to take it. We do have as a question, actually a couple of questions from Juven from the Netherlands. The first one is, uh, Dr. Ross, you have interacted with Stephen Meyer, the proponent of intelligent design for origins of life. What are your views on ID? Well, I've known Steve Meyer G for almost uh, 25, 30 years, and uh, we're good friends. Uh, his beliefs are very similar to my beliefs. Uh, 
where I'm different is I work for an organization where I can fully express those beliefs. And so uh, the intelligent design organization in Seattle, um, their whole point is they're trying to avoid identifying the intelligent designer. And by avoiding the intelligent designer and also avoiding taking any specific stance on the age of the earth, the age of the universe, the moment uh, when God created the first life forms, it really prevents you from developing a full orbed intelligent design model. And so um, that's probably where our organization differs most with the Discovery Institute. Uh, we feel that uh, you can actually make a stronger case uh, for intelligent design by identifying the intelligent designer and by getting specific on uh, the origin of the universe, origin of life, uh, the origin of human, human beings, and tying it in with different biblical texts. I think many people at the Discovery Institute are concerned about the Supreme Court cases that ruled against creationism. I wrote about that in my book, More Than a Theory, saying if you actually look at those Supreme Court rulings, and by the way, all of it is public domain now, so you can read it for yourself. And I give you the citations of More Than a Theory, basically making the point they ruled against young earth creationism. They did not rule against creationism or intelligent design. And basically we're making the point that right is already guaranteed in the US constitution. And uh, you've got to write also to put that into the public education curriculum on the proviso that it's got some scientific credibility. And that's where the creationists lost. They were not able in court to produce any scientific, and basically what the court said, we're not saying you gotta scientifically prove your case. You simply have to show uh, that your creation model has some demonstrated scientific integrity and credibility. But the fact that the defendants uh, were not able to produce any, uh, basically they said, well, since we can't try uh, this case on its religious or on its scientific merits, we'll have to try it on its religious merits. And there they brought forth a number of pastors and theologians who made the point uh, that the particular creation model being proposed uh, is limited to a small segment of the Christian community. And then the Supreme Court justices said, well, we rule in favor of them bringing their creation science into the public education arena. We're basically favoring one Christian denomination over several other Christian denominations, and that does violate the U.S. Constitution. And so they said, in that case, we can't permit this. But they made it very clear. Any model, uh, religious model, that has some demonstrable scientific uh, integrity or credibility is already permitted. And a good example of that is Big Bang Cosmology. Big Bang Cosmology is taught in high schools, is taught in college, is taught in graduate school, is freely discussed in the scientific literature, even though it has very significant theological implications. Uh, but the reason why is it has such strong scientific support. And I wrote about this in uh, The Fingerprint of God, my first book, making the point that initially there was very strong opposition to Big Bang cosmology expressly because of the Christian implications, the biblical implications. And so the atheists and agnostics in the astronomical community were doing everything they can to try to disprove Big Bang cosmology. But the astronomical evidence for it literally became astronomical. So in spite of its obvious biblical and Christian implications, Big Bang cosmology is now part of mainstream science and it's taught in the public education arena. That's just one of several examples. Eubin's other question is, were the Hebrew slaves involved in the building of Egyptian pyramids? It seems there is a dispute on timing the world's history. Yes, there is a dispute there. And uh, the biblical text is clear that uh, the Jews uh, were put into slavery uh, for building projects. It doesn't get explicit exactly what building projects that they were assigned to. It could have been the pyramids. 
Uh, most likely it was at least one or more of the pyramids since these pyramid constructions took place over several centuries. But exactly what pyramid or pyramids, uh, we, we simply don't have the evidence. There's also a debate about when the Exodus took place. What you see in the uh, theological literature, you've got one group of Bible scholars saying it took place in the uh, 12th or 13th century. Another group is saying it took place in the 15th century BC. I personally favor 15th century BC. Uh, that makes it easier to understand the historical books in the Old Testament and uh, just the all the events that took place uh, between the Exodus and uh, the time of King David taking the throne. That seems really hard to fit into just a couple hundred years, uh, but makes sense that the Exodus took place in the 15th century. That does help you to try to narrow down the building projects uh, that the Jewish slaves were involved in. And also that 15th century Exodus date uh, fits well, a uh, collapse of the Egyptian empire that occurred. It also fits well when Hebrew for the first time became a written language. And so uh, it explains why, for example, we see that the entire book of Job uh, is written in a way of its poetry designed to be easily memorized word for word. Whereas when we look at Genesis and the other four books of the Torah, uh, they wouldn't make sense unless Hebrew was already a written language. And it makes sense that those books would appear at uh, the moment that Hebrew did become a written language. So I personally favor a 15th century AD Exodus, uh, somewhere around 1450 uh, BC as a date uh, for the Exodus. It just seems uh, an easier date to uh, actually integrate all the historical books in the Bible and also to explain what happened to the Egyptian empire. Now the critics say, well, there's nothing recorded specifically about this collapse you speak about. But keep in mind, the Egyptians for a whole millennia had a practice of only recording their victories, not their defeats, only recording the good outcomes and not the bad outcomes. And therefore we wouldn't expect to see uh, bad news to show up uh, in the Egyptian records. That was just their policy. But something had to happen to explain uh, their dramatic collapse in the Egyptian empire and having three and a half million people leave Egypt. And this is important too. When you read those early chapters of Exodus, it makes it clear it was not just the blood descendants of a Jacob uh, that left Egypt. It says many Egyptians from all over the Egyptian empire decided to join with the Jews in the Exodus. So literally uh, the cream of Egyptian society said, you know what, we're not with the Pharaoh in this one. Uh, we're clearly seeing uh, that the hand of God is with these Jews and uh, we're gonna join them, we're gonna become Jews. And keep in mind that was always a feature of the Jewish faith that any Gentile could become a Jew uh, by you know, adopting the Jewish uh, practices and uh, you know, becoming uh, part of the, the Jewish, and evidently uh, a very large number of people throughout the Egyptian empire who are not blood descendants of, of Jacob decided, hey, we wanna become Jews. We're gonna join the Jews because we can see that God is with them. After all, look at those 10 plagues. The Jews are protected, dramatic evidence of where God's hand of blessing was. Thank you, Hugh. Jared Neal has a, I guess it's a complicated question. It's going to take a little bit to get through it, but it's really about the nature of uh, consciousness and the justification for believing in a mind rather than naturalism. And he asks, why isn't our own immediate experience of ourselves as personal agents who make meaningful decisions regarded as a powerful datum pointing to the ultimate ground of reality? I don't see how physics or chemistry provides any material basis for explaining it. The brain might explain our behavior, but not our self-awareness. From the standpoint of scientific materialism, we're ghosts in the biological machine, and the naturalistic world is haunted. What have I missed? How do they, the naturalists, respond to this challenge? 
Well, he's stating their dilemma very well. So that's a very eloquent uh, description of what's going on. Uh, at my office, uh, I've got about 50 books uh, written by people who are non-theists trying to explain uh, human consciousness. And these are the kind of remarks they make is that, you know, we're being stymied at every step of the way and trying to come up with this explanation. The one consensus these books all have, by the time they get to the end, we don't have a clue uh, where this consciousness comes from. But one thing we're all convinced about, it did not come from God. That's kind of where they end up. But if you're saying you haven't got a clue, then why are you ruling out God as a possible explanation? Uh, and where I've seen some of the best efforts at trying to explain human consciousness is basically physicists going to the quantum level and saying, since there's so much in quantum mechanics that we can't understand, and in particular, the fact that causality is hidden from human view, maybe something really weird is going on in that place where we can't explore with physics that explains consciousness. Uh, but then when you look at what quantum mechanics is based on, probabilistic outcomes, you know, our consciousness, our self-awareness, the decisions we make, it doesn't just seem to be random quantum outcomes. Uh, there really does seem to, I mean, we, our mind seems to actually be in control of our destiny. In fact, our court system is built on that. We hold people responsible for their conscious decisions. If it's really just quantum mechanics, then how could we hold people responsible? It's like, hey, this is just a probabilistic outcome. It's got nothing to do uh, with the biology of the individual, uh, nothing to do uh, with their morality, their decision-making context, which case, if we're really thinking that that is rational, we shouldn't be sending anybody in prison. We shouldn't be prosecuting anything. Everything's just random, which means that everyone is capable of doing things that are very harmful. But that's not what we observe. We observe in human society that you've got people that are incredibly altruistic and consistent in their altruism. We also see people that are incredibly evil and consistent in their evil. There really is a distinction we see here, and uh, that can't be explained if it's just quantum outcomes randomly occurring in some probabilistic way governed by quantum mechanics. I mean, that's the best I've seen. And so again, I think we really are forced to our supernatural explanation uh, for human consciousness, because it doesn't reside in physics, it doesn't reside in chemistry, it's beyond physics and chemistry. And if you really push it, uh, it really does demonstrate that there's something going on besides pure naturalism. Incidentally, several of these books I'm referring to, the author who starts off as a non-theist actually winds up concluding, I can no longer say that this is simply naturalism. There's something beyond naturalism. They won't identify what that something beyond is, but they are basically making a theistic conclusion. There's something beyond the physics and chemistry of the universe that must be behind our self-awareness and our consciousness. The other thing I've seen in reading these books is how many of them try to diminish our self-awareness and our consciousness and basically try to claim we don't have free will. But again, I think that runs into a real problem. There's overwhelming evidence that we human beings really do have free will and again, if we don't have free will, how can we hold anybody responsible for the actions that they make? Thank you, Hugh. Camille asks, what was it that after Descartes, science expanded so rapidly? I mean, mathematics, physics, and other areas of science. What was stopping it from expanding earlier? Well, I argue in a couple of my books that what really is behind the scientific revolution is Reformation Europe, uh, where what happened with the Reformation, and by the way, I'm not saying uh, just the Protestant Reformation, because Roman Catholicism also experienced a revolution. Eastern Orthodox Christianity also experienced a revolution. But the outcome of the Reformation was much broader exposure of the Bible uh, to the people that were alive. It wasn't just the priests who were reading the Bible. Lots of people began reading the Bible. Uh, you know, people who were 
uh, engage in science and engineering began to read the Bible. And as they began to study the Bible, they saw this repeated command to put everything to the test, hold fast to that which proves to be good and true. And they saw the Bible instructions and how to put everything to the test. And I've argued in my book in an appendix at Navigating Genesis that that was the birth of the scientific method. The scientific method comes from the pages of the Bible and from Reformation theology. And so with the birth of the Reformation in Europe, we see simultaneously the birth of the scientific revolution. And we're still experiencing that revolution to this day. I mean, there's literally been an exponential acceleration in scientific knowledge uh, since uh, the Reformation time. People have argued that you actually see the roots of the scientific revolution uh, going back earlier to the Renaissance. But again, if you look at that Renaissance literature, it was driven by people like Francis Bacon, uh, not a priest, uh, but actually looking what the Bible was teaching and being able to draw insights from the Bible that he began to apply uh, to his scientific research. So yeah, I think you could argue it does go back to the Renaissance. And as my colleague, uh, Ken Samples has argued, what you see in non-Christian religions is you see scientific sparks, but the sparks are quickly extinguished. You don't see a sustained scientific revolution until it shows up in the Renaissance and Reformation Europe and then begins to spread all over the world. And I've actually noticed when I've been speaking, for example, to audiences of uh, Hindus uh, that um, the fact th these people who have a Hindu worldview perspective, when they get exposed to science and engineering, they see it doesn't match what their Hindu scriptures teach about reality, but it does match what the Bible teaches about reality. And so I think that explains why we're seeing uh, amongst the more educated uh, Hindus, uh, a dramatic uh, movement uh, towards the Christian faith. Thank you, Hugh. Well, we have some more questions coming in. Uh, Ewan asks, uh, what do you think of views that Christianity caused modernity among humans? For example, Jordan Peterson, Tom Holland, etc. Well, I get a lot of questions about those individuals and a lot of what they say I agree with, a lot of what they say I do not agree with. Uh, so in fact, I know a number of people are trying to set up a dialogue and I'd be open uh, to that uh, dialogue. Uh, and, you know, there's what's called modernity, and then there's post-modernity. Uh, but as you look at both of them, uh, and they, they, they depart from the Christian faith in different ways. Uh, and then you get what's, you know, this post-modernism. Uh, modernism is basically making the point uh, that, uh, you know, just from an intellectual perspective, uh, we can gain all his knowledge and we can do it independent of any religious perspective. But I think the modernists are overlooking, however, is that it's much more efficient to do it from a Christian theistic perspective than it is from a non-theistic perspective. And then postmodernism is basically making the point uh, that this idea that we can gain truth through the assumption that there's always a right answer and a wrong answer, that everything's governed by laws that are fixed and don't change. Uh, and I do see postmodernism thriving in the arts and the social sciences. In fact, one time I spoke at a famous uh, University of the Arts here in Southern California, and a whole lot of professors jumped all over me because they said that I was a modernist. And what they meant was, I actually believe that physics and math gives right answers. And uh, they were basically arguing for a relativism. And my response was simply this. You might be able to survive as a postmodernist in sociology. You're dealing with a science that's so complex, you really can't pin anything down with any great precision. But it doesn't work in mathematics and physics and astronomy. You don't find postmodern professors in the physics department two plus two really does equal four and not five. And uh, the laws of physics really are valid, 
They're constant, they're reliable, we can trust them. We got experiments to prove that to 20 places the decimal in some cases. Uh, but again, I would argue uh, that there's a much more efficient way to do our science research than from say the modernistic perspective of uh, two to 300 years ago. And I've actually challenged a number of my scientists peers saying, if you were actually to do your scientific research from a biblical redemptive perspective, and what I mean by that, where we live in a universe and an earth in which everything has been designed so that billions of human beings uh, can be delivered from their sin and evil and come into an eternal loving relationship with their creator. If you were to do your scientific research from that perspective, it's going to make you a more successful scientist because that's really the reality. We live in a universe where literally every event and every component uh, plays some role, uh, some major, some minor role in making possible the redemption of billions of us human beings. If there's a follow-up, I'd be happy to take it. Well, for right now, we have a, another question. In artificial intelligence, and this comes from Steve, if machine sensors record itself and surroundings, retains it in memory for recall, then it can discover, discover itself as an entity by further sensing and comparison to memory. It can preserve self. It is self-aware. It can relate itself to surroundings. How might this be different from consciousness? Well, uh, I remember that movie, 2001, A Space Odyssey, in which there was this computer, HAL, and uh, it had some of those features. And basically, the plot of that movie was that this computer, HAL, uh, was uh, on a spaceship on its way to Jupiter. And the role of the computer was to preserve the lives of astronauts that were put into suspended animation because after all, they didn't want to have to waste all the energy of trying to feed these individuals. So they kind of put them into some kind of a deep sleep, uh, suspended animation, uh, where they would be awakened uh, at the point where they got to, to Jupiter. However, the plot of the movie is that this machine, not only had the software designed to preserve the lives of these individuals, it actually had self-preservation software. And the plot of the movie is that the self-preservation software, basically software to guarantee that the computer keep operating and not in any way be disabled by any kind of external attack. Uh, that the plot of the movie is that that software actually took precedence over the software to preserve the lives of the, uh, of the individuals, uh, of the, uh, uh, the, the astronauts on board. And then you can watch the movie how this one astronaut who was awake uh, basically cripples a computer and how the computer fought back. That's not a self-aware computer. It's basically a computer uh, that has software designed to uh, protect. Uh, that's different from, and actually, you know, the movie tried to show this computer as being conscious, how it could play chess. And uh, back then in 2001, people thought we'll never make a computer uh, that can beat a human grandmaster at chess. Uh, today, we realize it can. The reason why it can, it can store huge amounts of memory. And as uh, you know, we're hearing here, these computers are now so big and so sophisticated, they can build up this huge treasure chest of uh, information and use that information to make decisions that are impossible for us humans to make without possible errors because we don't have that capability of being able to reliably store that huge quantity of information in the human brain and to be able to access it as quickly as a computer can. So these are where computers can help us, but that's a whole lot different than computers that can actually emotionally relate to us and uh, actually uh, enter into say a marriage relationship. Uh, it is possible to put software in a computer where every time you turn the computer on, it says warm, fuzzy things to you. Uh, but I can tell you it's not the same as having your wife or your child uh, make those kinds of comments to you because there you're dealing with a free will being that can choose to do that or choose not to do that. That computer is basically limited 
to, to software. Now, I think where things are really beginning to be sophisticated, we not only have computers today uh, that uh, can take advantage of all this information and reprogram itself to be more efficient. So in many respects, computers these days are actually capable of writing their own software. Uh, but, and so it's that programming capability that I think is giving people pause to think, wow, we really are building uh, conscious machines. Uh, and again, my colleague, uh, Jeff Zwierink, he's actually got a book project underway where he's gonna be writing a book on artificial intelligence and taking on this very question. Uh, can artificially intelligent machines ever reach the point of being conscious and self-aware like we are? Uh, and incidentally, uh, he and George Haraxon did an RTV Live just this past Thursday. I think it's already posted. Yeah, in fact, I know it's already posted. It's posted on YouTube uh, in our Reasons to Believe YouTube channel. You can watch that. They discuss these very issues about what we can expect in the future computers to do. They're going to get a lot more sophisticated and apparently able to adapt to their environment. Uh, but it's one thing to adapt to an environment. I mean, bacteria adapt to their environment, uh, but bacteria are not conscious like we human beings are. And it's one thing they were discussing, that there's a fundamental difference between the awareness of a bacterium, the awareness of your pet dog, and the awareness of a human being. In each case, we see a quantum leap. And I think that explains why we see these three uses of the word bara in Genesis 1. One for life forms that are purely physical, one for life forms that are physical and soulish, and one and only life form, uh, we human beings that are physical, soulish, and spiritual. Again, I'll take a follow-up if there's a follow-up question. You know, I think we're uh, going to have to make this our last question. We're very close to the end here, our recording okay. time. Um, what happens when something, a star or anything else in the universe, gets in a black hole? Where, where is it after it's caught? Well, uh, there are giant black holes, supermassive black holes, fortunately not in our galaxy, but in other galaxies that actually gravitationally attract a star and the star gets sucked into the black hole. And as it's getting sucked in, just outside the event horizon, there's a very efficient conversion of the mass of that star into energy, which explains why we see such a huge energy eruption uh, from that event. I mean, that's what quasars are. Uh, quasars are supermassive black holes that are consuming matter and converting that matter into energy outside the event horizon. But once that star enters the event horizon, no energy uh, from that star can escape uh, from the black hole. And so that star becomes part of the black hole. And the black hole is a massive body it just continues to collapse under the force of gravity. And uh, that will continue until the black hole uh, shrinks down to the size of a quantum entity. And when it does, then quantum mechanical effects can actually overcome the gravity. And that black hole, <laughs> as uh, Stephen Hawking explained, can become a white hole. But Stephen Hawking also calculated how much time would be needed for a black hole to shrink down to a size where everything trapped inside the black hole would quantum tunnel out and the black hole become a white hole. Uh, the smaller the black hole, the faster it becomes a white hole. But the smallest conceivable black hole is a few times the mass of our star, the sun. And even a black hole that small, the length of time to become a white hole exceeds 10 to the 66 years. And since the universe is only 10 to the 10 years old, uh, there are black holes, but no white holes. The universe is, by orders and orders of magnitude, way too young for any black hole to become a white hole. But if you wait long enough, that star that gobbled up by the black hole, eventually uh, all the energy uh, in that uh, star will quantum tunnel out. Hey, you, I think we're... Uh... We're done, we're our, okay. our time limit now. All right, well, I'll stop the record.
And anybody who wants to get the recording can do so uh, by going to uh, paradoxes.org. Uh, and we also 